Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Edwards, the Executive Director and CEO of the First Center for the Visual Arts. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to welcome you and to thank our members for um, your support throughout the year. And we're very glad you're here this evening. We are previewing two exhibitions that will remain on view through January 12th, 2014. Hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, 30 Americans will be in the Ingram Galleries, and Anna Maria Tavares' Deviating Utopias will be in the Gordon Contemporary Artist Project Gallery. We gratefully acknowledge our 2013 Ingram Gallery Platinum sponsor, the HC Foundation, HCA Foundation on behalf of HCA and the TriStar family of hospitals. 30 Americans is organized and drawn from the acclaimed Rubel family collection in Miami and includes more than 70 works by 31 emerging and established African American artists working in the last 30 years. We are extremely grateful to the Rubels for making this exhibition possible and available to us. Katie Dalmay served as the curator in charge at the Frist. We are honored to have with us this evening the collectors, Don and Mara Rubel, and the director of the Rubel family collection, Juan Valadez, who will speak in just a moment. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to make a few announcements. We hope you will uh, join us for uh, the Artist Perspective by Hank Will Willis Thomas on October 24th at 6.30 and Nina Chan Chanel Abney on November 22nd. Both of these programs are at 6.30 here in the auditorium. The Curator's Tour, tour will be by Katie Dalmay on October 31st at noon at the exhibition's entrance. And please join us for Basquiat, the film, on November 15th at 7 p.m. here in the auditorium. We're also delighted to welcome to Nashville the Brazilian artist Ana Maria Tavares. Um, please join us tomorrow at noon here in this room when she will deliver the artist's perspective on her work. Ana Maria Tavares was introduced to us by Vesna Polovich, who was instrumental in the establishment of Conversation Conversas, an, ex an exchange between the art departments of Vanderbilt University and the University of Sao Paulo. The program has been funded by the Curb Center and the Center for Latin American Studies, both at Vanderbilt. Special thanks to Chief Curator Mark Scala for organizing Ana Maria Tavares' Deviating Utopias. Tavares finds inspiration in the architecture of the modern city, particularly in the stylistic grammar of Oscar Niemeyer and other Brazilian utopian modernist architects who were responsible for the urban transformation in Brazil after World War II. The centerpiece of this exhibition is her four-sided immersive video, Air Shaft to Piranese, 2008, a sequence of elaborate interiors seen from multiple, multiple perspectives in constant motion. We are grateful to Nashville-based musician and composer Brian Siskind, who created the musical component for Airshaft titled Nidderoy, Water That Hides. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Rick Scheimer of Blackhawk, Blackhawk Audio, who donated a portion of, of the audio equipment. As I mentioned earlier, Anna Maria will present the artist perspective tomorrow at noon in this room. Please join us for a screening of the film Brazil on October 18th at 7 p.m. We also thank Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their ongoing operating support. The Frist is proud to be part of Arttober, a citywide celebration of the arts organized by the Metro Nashville Arts Commission. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Don and Mara Rubel began acquiring contemporary art in the 1960s. In 1964, they established the Rubel Family Collection in New York City. It is now one of the world's largest privately owned contemporary art collections with over 6,000 works by well-known and emerging artists from around the world. The foundation has been recognized as a pioneer in what has been referred to as the Miami model, whereby private collectors create a new independent form of public institution. 
The foundation maintains an internship program, an ongoing lecture series, an extensive art and exhibition loan program which benefits museums around the world, such as ourselves. The foundation also partners with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, enabling thousands of school children to visit and engage with the foundation's collection each year. The foundation has a public research library with over 40,000 volumes and a comprehensive contemporary art bookstore. Juan Valadez was born in Brasilia, Brazil. He graduated from New York's esteemed Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in 1999. A year later, he began working for the Rubel's Foundation and has been the foundation's director since 2009. Please join me in welcoming, I promise you, the very entertaining Don and Mara Rubel and Juan Valadez. Thanks so much for coming. There's uh, some people here at the Frist we'd, we'd like to thank for making this possible and making the exhibition look so brilliant. Um, the Frist family, of course, and we were fortunate enough to meet Billy Frist earlier today. Uh, Susan Edwards, <coughs> Mark Scala, Katie Delmez, Megan Robertson, Wallace Joyner. Joyner. I was speaking with Wallace almost daily for a few months and thought I was going to have to tell my wife about Wallace and I. <laughs> they didn't, um, <laughs> She's in California. I think they arranged that. They split us up. <laughs> She's not here right now. Richard Fester, Hans Schmidt, um, Motson, Scott Tom, Dewey Tompkins, and Brandon Nets. Um, so thanks for, for having us, and thanks for doing such a brilliant job. Um, some, some days my, my job can be difficult, like everyone, but today, tonight it's, it's very easy because I'm sitting next to two brilliant people and two brilliant public speakers. So with that, I'm done for the night. And, uh, <laughs> but I want to I want to just take a minute, and, and they're 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 modest. So I I'm going to um, talk about the scope of, of the enterprise that, that they're doing that they started 50 years ago when they were married. I'm just mm -hmm. going to spend two minutes uh, giving you all some background. Maybe you haven't uh, visited our foundation in Miami. I'd like to just talk for a minute about that, and then and then we'll move into uh, 30 Americans and and their process and and what they do. So. Here's a shot of their living room, as photographed by Louis Lawler in 1982. And this is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. It's, it's pretty extreme. I mean, there's a, a Deborah Butterfield sculpture there that's pretty big, but um, it's, it's still somewhat sane. That's um, our dog, by the way. That's their dog, yeah. And then, and then we get to this. Um, and these are, we, so the foundation has 28 galleries. Uh, it's just about 40,000 square feet. And this is, this is what we do, and, and we present thematic exhibitions every year, and we only show artwork that the Rebels have acquired. And these are some other, this is a public research library. I don't, I don't think there's a better research library in, on, in the country, to be honest with you. Uh, you have some school children here. But then, so they started. Remember what we said, a little modesty. <laughs> so, no, no, that, that, you guys can be modest. I, I have to paint an accurate picture. It's, it's absurd, this, this, it's really amazing. It's really amazing what they've done. <laughs> So, it's more right. absurd than amazing, actually. <laughs> so, it's a little embarrassing. We're, it, okay, it okay, is. Okay, it okay, is. Okay. You, you should step it. out and then, for the next, <laughs> and then come back in in five minutes. But, but they started, you know, as you acquire a painting, as you acquire a sculpture, they found room for it in, in, their, in their apartment in New York. And, um, and then, then some of it went to storage. But there were a few pieces in the early 90s that were uh, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, and they realized some other. They'd have to look to some other model of presenting these. So, for example, this sculpture by Are Charlie you Ray. So, this sculpture by Charlie Ray, they acquired in '92. It, it was made for for the documenta that year, and um, this is not one for the family room or m maybe the master bedroom, <laughs> perhaps the playroom. But the same year, then then this uh, by Paul McCarthy. Culture. This is animatronic. This this sculpture with a taxidermy goat and two two figures, a father and son. And this installation by Katie Noland around the same time. So they have to start rethinking. And they find this building halfway between Miami International Airport and the beach, where they'd started working in real estate uh, after their son Jason had moved down here. And uh, this building was, yeah, I mean, um, 
it, it was a steal. I mean, you, you guys found this amazing location that nobody had been looking at. I mean, riots a few years earlier had, had consumed some of this neighborhood, but they, they thought it was um, ideal. These are some early uh, presentations of artwork there. Um, very raw, and then it was remodeled. And, and then we come to this, where, where their, uh, their living quarters were added to the, to the foundation, to the museum. It's, it's accessed via the library. This is, and, and they don't have any, they had zero artwork for years in their, in their apartment, but as I run out of room, I, uh, we have three buildings for storage, but I run out, and, and so things move into their, into their homes. This is in their, in their bedroom. This is uh, in their entrance. This is a, an obelisk by Damien Ortega. It's very hard to put it. This is their breakfast table. This is, where, this is what they consume, though. This is how they've <laughs> educated themselves. And this is, uh, this is a good portrait of the rebels. The catalog and the tennis rackets are critical, critical, because every morning, before I get to work, Mira and Don, they, they've laid in that bed I showed you and spoken about contemporary art for a few hours in the, before the sun rises. Then they swim laps. Then they play tennis. Then Mira <laughs> cooks breakfast for them. Then she cooks for the staff of 10. Or, you know, and and it, it's really amazing. And then I show up. And this is one of our, this is an adjoining, you know, this is just behind your, your home. This is, this is one of our storage areas here. That's our graphic designer there, Chi Lam. Um, some more panels that we had. And we use, a, we use a forklift nearly daily. There's William, who was here. He fell in love with Nashville. Other buildings, lots of crates. Now we have two forklifts and two scissor lifts. So it, this is one painting they acquired. They went to China, visited almost 100 studios, and this is a triptych where the center panel weighs 1,000 pounds. It can just can kill a few people if it were to fall. This is it. This is it looking somewhat tame, but that's what it involved hanging it. This is moving a Franz West upstairs. But then we also like to, to bring artists in. Richard Jackson making really beautiful installations in his 70s, 76, and young artists as well. Sterling Ruby made these paintings. John Miller working on installation. Kari Upson building a huge installation. It's a sculpture of hers that's beautiful. It relates to Charlie's um, orgy that you saw earlier. Last year we had this young gentleman, Oscar Murillo, who was 26, come and live in the Rebels' home while they were with their grandchildren out west, and uh, he spent five weeks making a huge mess of, of, of the museum, but visitors were allowed to come in and watch, and uh, it was very prolific. This was, this was the show that resulted. This is a, a, a sneak preview of what we'll be presenting this, this winter in December. This is, a, this is composed, of, it's all hung from the ceiling. It's 9,000 sheets of rice paper um, that take, uh, this is a gentleman installing it, in, in, uh, this is in London. So that'll be, um, a project, but now, now we're now we're back to where it started. This is the photo of Don, Jason, Rebel, who's an integral part of, of all of this. Their son and Keith Haring in 1985. So, so let's let's start quickly uh, with with how you met. Um, I believe your first cousins, Don. How, how, does, it, how does it go? <laughs> what, how did you, where did you meet? Actually, actually, how did we meet? We we I had gone to Cornell and I and. In Cornell, the, the most beautiful woman always was studying in the library. So when we came back to New York, naturally I went to the library every night, and sitting across from me for three consecutive months was this absolutely beautiful woman. <laughs> Tom, you never told who, me that. Here tonight. Who, and we never said a word to each other for three months. And I was really shy. And she apparently, contrary to what she tries to tell you, must have been pretty shy because she didn't say anything either. And finally, after three months, I said, would you like to get a vanilla egg cream, which is sort of a unique phenomenon in New York. It doesn't have any eggs in it, but it, it's a drink. And, and we went, and I was, with, I was at a total loss for words when we, as soon as we left the library, so I proposed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the most amazing thing is she accepted. <laughs> in which case, I was again at a loss for words. I didn't know how to respond to that. So yeah, that's but, how we but met. you know, I know this is, it's getting personal, but it's kind of relevant in the conversation about um, the, this journey of collecting art because people always say, you know, collectors have a certain rap about them. You know, they're, they're considered just like accumulators and um, um, these wealthy people who accumulate things. For us, it's been a, an extraordinary. I mean, it is about accumulating. It is about taking responsibility and and living with these uh, all this all these 
objects which take tremendous amount of care and devotion and, uh, and beyond. But um, intuition, I mean, really, we don't spend enough time talking about intuition when you think about it. We, we teach kids how to, you know, we talk about mathematics, we talk about, uh, lit you know, we talk about certain skills, but I don't think there's a class on intuition. Like, how do you know certain things? Like, how do you trust yourself to know things? And I think from the, I really knew that that was a serious question. Even, I mean, I, mean, I was literally like, Two years old at the time, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, but how did I know that that was a real question? How did I know that I needed to give a real answer? How did I know that I meant it? And the same thing you can ask, how do we know when we go to all the thousands of studios that we've been visiting over the last 50 years, how do we know to engage as deeply as, as we do? Um, I don't know, how do we know? Intuition, <clears throat> and intuition. I mean, so that, that kind of worked out. I said yes, and I mean, it's, it, it, I don't want you to think it's been easy the last 50 years on any <laughs> level whatsoever. We collect as a collaborative. We have to agree on everything we buy. We never, except for one time that Don bought something. I mean, some men have promiscuous love affairs. My husband has a promiscuous purchase of an artwork. That, now, you may consider a promiscuous love affair serious, but this is worse. No, it's serious because... Well, she handled it exactly how every wife would handle a promiscuous love affair. She made me return it. <laughs> so. No, because... Well, I mean, I could just... Um, I have to... Well, think that, I mean... This usually means, okay, Mira. No, no, but, uh, but, but Mira, Mira comes, I mean, Mira came to this country fleeing, fleeing Europe from Russia as, as an immigrant. Her family was penniless, and, and they arrived in New York. And, um, and, and Don grew up in a very modest household as Actually, well. Don, this is very relevant, okay? I have to tell you but that, I mean, this... But he has the question. No, 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 I know, I know, but before the, you finish the question, mm. you know we like to interject. No, no, please. Um, <laughs> um, we're in a form of post office, right? right. Wasn't it a post office? Right. Don's, Don's, Don's dad, father was a postal worker. Yeah, Don worked. Don's father retired uh, from the postal office after 30 years. Well, actually, every Christmas while I was in school, I worked in the post office uh, to, to earn some money for school. And I, saw, I was the best sorter they ever had. I used to sort, you know. And we didn't have zip codes in those days, so you had to read the handwriting. So it's just, very familiar, comfortable territory for me. Yeah, but you know what? Um, this was the WPA period, you know, and um, his father was on uh, on track to go to college and and become a dentist. I mean, he was going to go to dental school. He had big dreams about what he was going to become, but he ended up taking the. I mean, in those days, you needed to take whatever job you could, especially you were like nine nine children in the family. So of all not of, in our, my family, in his family. In his family. And so he took the exam, passed it, and he, it was a big celebration that he could then support the entire family. So there's a lot, you know, the post office and also the WPA here and the, you know, the, the art that was created as a result of saving this country from, from I, you know, from we people. We have to get to the art. No, okay. But Don, oh, were, were, you, were, you, were you stealing every stamp off of the envelopes and I, collecting I, I, them? Or oh, this that, is a good point. This I mean, when he was in the library, did he drag bags of, Baseball no, cards, no, or like, what, you how bring, did you? You bring up the best part of it because I am not an actual collector. In fact, I was born with, into a family where every day I heard how people perished. This was the, uh, uh, the, 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 the story of how people's possessions kept them fixed and um, inflexible. My father, who was in the Polish army, and when Hitler he was, in the, he, he, he was in the Polish army, and he literally came back one night. I mean, he deserted to come back and say to his family, unless you leave here tonight, um, there won't be a tomorrow. And my parents always talked about how those who would leave behind everything survived, and those who stayed put and were there to protect their possessions would perish. So, so uh, she gets involved with someone who, at the age of three, was collecting <laughs> bottle tops by 
five had a stamp collection, which I still have intact to this day. What about yeah, baseball cards? Baseball cards. I was missing Pee Wee Reese, but I had every other card in, in the thing. So it was so, a real con. I mean, I really grew up with this idea of, you know, the, you know in like Huckleberry Finn, where the images of the, the kid with a stick and a bundle. I, I really, I, 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 to me, in my own head, I always felt like I would be like my father. If I ever had to run, I could run. And possessions don't, you know, possessions weigh you down. So I exercised that by always having a carry-on. I never checked my luggage. <laughs> but it was interesting. In order to convince Mira that collecting was a possibility, the first major piece we bought was by an artist, an Italian artist, Francesco Clemente. And it was one of his great paper pieces but he had done them in India, where there was no uh, linen or canvas, and so he had to get a whole series of, uh, of paper that was brought to him. He'd uh, glue them together or tape them together and do the piece. And I said to him, you see, we can fold it up and we can leave without <laughs> Carrying piece. it on our heads. But and, and um, she brought I, into I will right? make, okay, I've never made this confession in public, but, uh, but this is actually the first time that, we never rehearsed this, so I never know what we're going to talk about. After this morning, I thought we talked about everything, but I guess there's something else to talk about. But Don never before told the story of how we met. Usually I'm the one who's telling the story about how we met, and he proposed to me, and then he said, oh, come on, you're I don't know. But this was the first time he really told the story, so this <coughs> confirms that it's the true story. But I will say, tell you, uh, I'll make a confession since he made that confession. Um, I would have followed him to the ends of the earth. I, I would have become anything. I would have gone to Alaska with him. But instead... It's not the end of the earth. She's using... <laughs> she's, using <laughs> she's saying in past tense, no, too. That I was past gone, tense. No, no. I, I would have gone exactly. to the place past where... You, tense. I would have gone to the place where you can see Russia. What, is that Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. But then, then while Don's studying, you, you would meet on, on his breaks between classes, right, and walk? No, no, Don was, well, no, Don, okay, now we're getting personal. So I was studying, at, I was in Brooklyn College. He had graduated Cornell, and he was actually studying for his actuarial exam. He, he decided he was a theoretical mathematician who was going to study to become an actuary, and he was taking all these exams. I was very, I mean, all the books that he had in front of him, I saw, thought to myself, what common language are we going to have? I mean, my worst subject is math. You know? I, mean, I was a psych major, I was an education major, but who knew from like all this math stuff? And I thought, wow, this is crazy. I mean, I didn't even know how to, I mean, I, I didn't talk to him because I didn't know what could I say. I mean, no, but that's why I went to medical school, because she was a hypochondriac. <laughs> and that she understood. No, no, actually. The reason he went to medical school is one day, I would always, so we actually spent a lot of no, time to leave out. Leave out? Yes. Okay, well, leave out. <laughs> but, 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 you, but they would find themselves in New York walking into storefronts that artists had converted. Oh, no, this is okay. So fast yes. forward, okay? So one day, Don says, hey, this is crazy. He says, he was working for Equitable. And one day he said, you know, I just can't, they had this executive program and it's basically, they describe, they also tell you who you should marry. Imagine an executive program. This morning, we were talking about how corporations would tell black women that, they, that, that their hair had to be like straight instead of curly or whatever. It was like, you know, they want, they, the corporation had a playbook on how you should look, what you should say. And in, in those days, Equitable actually had a, like an executive training program on who you should marry. And he came down, I'll never forget this because I was waiting for him downstairs on 6th Avenue at this very, you know, this big building there. And he said, Mira, I just got a description of the person I should marry, and you're not it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is crazy. This, I'm, 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 I'm shocked. I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I love the people I met this morning. And I feel like we're friends. I can really, I trust to share these. Don't tell anybody else. <laughs> so, okay. So what happened next was, Within the week, seriously, after this, he took this very seriously, that th this was a meeting on who you should marry, and you're not the person, so what am I going to do? So he comes to me and he says, well, I think I cannot give up, our, I mean, I, we're, we're like getting married. So he decides to go to medical school, 
And we move, and he, of course, at first, anyway, he gets into George Washington University, was the first school in New Orleans, and I have a whole experience there, which was horrifying. You know, I, I encounter, no, well, I encounter, I, I encounter segregation. I mean, I did, I had, I, had I, I read about it, I heard about it, but I didn't even like, it, it just, it, it like, when you really confront a white bathroom and a black bathroom, it's like horrifying. A white, uh, a white uh, a, a drinking fountain and a black drinking fountain. So fast forward, fortunately, he also gets into uh, NYU because he decides to go to medical school. He says, forget the corporation route. I'm going to just, I want to do something else with my life. And then he decides to go to medical school. So we get married in August, and he starts medical school in, uh, in September. And we live on 8th Avenue, and we take long walks during his study. I'm now teaching at uh, Head Start, and he's in medical in, school. In Harlem. Pardon? In Harlem. Right? In Harlem. I love it. It's an amazing. It's just totally fantastic. Kennedy said, what can you do for, what can you do for your country? And I think to myself, wow. I'm just like, and he's, this Head Start program starts. I'm watching television. I'm thinking, wow, I got to do this. And I loved it. Where was I? Oh, I, yes. I and then during <laughs> the, OK. So then we start taking these walks during his, you know, study between studying. Because, you know, I have all these walks and study, study. Start walking. And we encounter the most amazing studios in all these storefronts in New York. At the time, real estate was very cheap. This was in the 60s. And artists actually inhabited storefronts. So they live there, they work there, and occasionally they actually use the storefront as a kind of gallery to, to, to communicate with the world. We started meeting some of these artists, and it was magical. And at some point, somebody, we felt like, wow, we can actually, maybe we should, like, could we possibly buy a drawing? Could we possibly buy a painting? And how could we possibly do that? So on a $100 salary, which was, I was working for the New York City public school system at the time, it was $100,000, uh, $100,000, a, a week. Um, we decided we would make a budget of $25 a week to buy, at some point, we're giving $5 a week to five artists. But you know what? They say a long journey begins with the first step. And that's what we did. Wow, and so sorry, it took too long. Don't no, 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 no. It's great. Quick. It's great. And then, you, and then you'd, you'd, you'd find yourself at, at a place like I mean, some, something like the Mud Club, where you run in. Oh, yeah. to, I mean, how did you, how did you find? I mean, were you involved in counterculture? Like, how did you end up at a place like the Mud Club? How did Meeting, we end up in the subways in New York? Oh, well, we looking ended up at in looking the Mud Club. In a, we would in those days, we would literally go to fifty galleries every month, twenty-five studios every month. We subscribed to every single art journal. And we still, the proof is that we still have all the journals. Yeah. Uh, so that's and, your education. And, and that was our education. Yeah. Actually, neither of us had any uh, formal art education at that point. And, uh, but we would speak to the artists, and, and we realized that for us, the artists were the real talent in the community. I mean, you know, they, the, the artists feel art is much or better than everyone else. We speak to all the writers, all the curators, all the other collectors, but the artists are the ones that feel the art. And someone had mentioned that there was this show at a place called the Mud Club on the second floor. And so uh, they said, but, but the only thing is it opens at midnight. So we went there at midnight, and you have to understand, we never stayed up to midnight in those days. We went there at midnight, and in this room, was no one, literally. And then we noticed that there's this kind of strange looking creature at the back of the room. On a who's swing. Who's on a swing. Going, he built a swing inside going the, back uh, in and the forth. Uh, gallery. And we, we introduced ourselves, and, and, and it was a very interesting show. It was, it was a show of graffiti art, which was just beginning to happen then. And uh, we said, this looks very interesting. We'd love to meet the people who are doing this. He said, well, it's fine. We can." go and meet the people. And he said, when should we do this? He said, well, it's too early now. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're, they're, on the, they, they're on the subways, and you can go meet them. So we go, and we have this really interesting night. We meet a bunch of artists. And we were so impressed with this guy that at the end of the night, we said, by the way, what do you do? He said, I'm an artist. And we said, 
can we see the work? Because he, he just seemed, there was something special about him. And he said, well, you can't see the work now, but I, uh, it just isn't ready to be seen. I said, well, here's our number. When the work is ready to be seen, you call us. And about a, six months or a year later, we get a call from, uh, from this art, from this, uh, he said, well, my, I'm gonna have a show at St. Mark's Church. And no, no, fortunately, it wasn't St. Mark's, it was on St. Mark's No, it's Street. a St. Mark's Church in, in, the, in the basement of a church. And we said, fine, as long as it's not at midnight. <laughs> and, and he said, well, it is, and it's at, it's at eight o'clock at night. So we go there at eight o'clock at night, and we see the show, and the work is unbelievable. And we said, we'd love to buy the entire show. He said, well, you can't, you can buy almost the entire show, but someone bought one piece. And the artist turned out to be Keith Herring. And, and that, this was our introduction to Keith. But the, the thing to keep in mind is this is the story of art. The story of art is meeting the most incredible people with the most incredible talent. And if you're lucky, you happen to be there when that talent manifests itself. So that's a long way to tell a which short good, story. Which is yeah. the, the circle that we began with, which is about, it's all <laughs> about intuition. It, it's, there's, no, there's no, I mean, there's so many talented artists. There's so many amazing, amazing people uh, making art. It's just a question of what in your personal life attracts you to that story? What in your personal life, um, uh, what, what, uh, what is it about that art that changes the way you see the world? Um, it's, it's hard, I'm, I'm always astonished that it never stops. Just, I guess, sorry, just today, the, the Anna Maria Tavara installation just blew us all away. Oh my God, and, that was I mean, incredible. Have you seen the video that Anna Maria it's did? Phenomenal. You, yeah. you have to see, it's just, it's if you have a tendency towards being a little dizzy and vertigo, don't go, you know, go only for a small time. But the or work if you is need, incredible. Or if you need any uh, substances to get you high, <laughs> you can save the money <laughs> and see this. <laughs> See this because instantly you will have. It's you'll, great. No, it, it's, it's really, it's you'll really feel good. It. You'll work feel it. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, because you, you, you say, I mean, I'm so glad you, you mentioned intuition early on because Don just said you walk into St. Mark's the church basement and you say the work was incredible. What, do, what are you basing that on? I mean, what. what okay. When you see, this, this, is, this is what happens. It's like, do you know the feeling when you like, you're going to a dinner party or you're in a place. And suddenly, I mean, this sounds crazy, but you meet a person that you want to know. Why does that happen? Why does it happen? Of all the people there, you see a person, you say, this is a person I want to know. Sometimes kids in the second grade tell you, I met my best friend in second grade. I knew this was going to be my, my life friend. How do you know these things? But you know, when it brings... Uh, you, just, you just know it because it happens to answer or address something in your life that is so quintessential to going forward. I, I would say with Keith... What? But it brings up an important point. I mean, the, the, the best art, the best new art, and the most interesting young art has within it something that you don't understand. And, and, and that... And, and it oftentimes will make you uncomfortable. It's always easier to look at a third generation impressionist art because you're familiar with the style, you're familiar with the form and the techniques. But the best art is it, it, contemporary art. And you have to remember that all art was once contemporary. So, you know, if you happen to be around when Leonardo was doing his work, this was contemporary. And he would have made you just as uncomfortable. And we, we spend nights saying, if we were there when, when uh, Warhol and Rauschenberg were first, in, and would we have recognized it as interesting? And you don't know, but you kind of hope that the fact that, that there was some strange element in the work would have been enough to attract but you know what? Him. Contemporary art, in the final analysis, is a belief that the new has something to teach us. Now, there are people, I mean, I know, I know some people, I don't want to know them too intimately, but I know some people who really don't want anything new. Do you know, you know the person who says to you, I have all the friends I need, I don't need to make another friend. Do you know people like that? I mean, I have so many friends, I don't have a tough time for the friends I have. I have more time for the new friends. I need new friends. I really do. 
Now, it doesn't mean that I don't love my old friends. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> And I never get tired of my husband. But, <laughs> no, but it's not that it, I'm tired of you, old friends. Or it's, just that, it's just that I think we have an endless capacity. I really think, I think it, people have an endless capacity. Because after all, the new is there whether we want it or not. You may not want it. You may, I mean, you may say, I don't want the new. But you know what? It's going to hit you in the face sooner or later. The reality of the new is, is shocking. That's why they call it the shock of the new. Because whether you want it or not, you're gonna, the, 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 the conditions of the new face us every day. And they're totally unpredictable. And contemporary art is the same way. And I think it prepares us for the shock. Because if you follow contemporary art, those artists have intuitions, trained intuitions, they have that's what makes artists so extraordinary, is they are masters of intuition, masters of feelings, where the rest of us are busy living our lives and figuring out how to survive. Artists figure out how to survive, but they are completely tuned into, you know, like, like when is a storm coming? Or I, when is the hurricane, you know, going to hit? Is the Actually, it's when, interesting. One of my favorite questions to ask a, an artist is, when did you realize that you were different? And, and it's, you know, at first they're kind of all, I'm not different, I'm like, but, but there always was a moment in their life when they realized there was, a, and it sounds so romantic to say it, but they realized that they, were, that they, they saw the world in a slightly different way. You know, now, they're not, I'm sorry, they're not great at other things. Like they, they may not be great at public speaking and they may not be great at music, but they're almost like idiot savants. Their art is their way of communicating and you shouldn't judge them by any other way but the ability to make the art and to communicate through the art. There's, a, there's the, the post-it notes that, that the walls are occurring in there are really potent and poignant and, and I took a photo of one that says, are you uncomfortable, think about why use the discomfort to help you grow. <laughs> it's there very it similar to what you all are talking about. Um, so, so to Keith, speaking to Keith Herring, um, this, is, this is later, I guess you've known him for six, six or seven years here, and these are some of the early acquisitions. So when they're, it's amazing the breadth and depth, what, when they're pulling into an artist, they're really, I mean, they back the U-Haul truck up to the studio, I mean, it's really incredible here. I mean, this is, and, and it's, what's beautiful, what I'm very happy about is that, that in Don and Mayer's lifetime, they're seeing things like, Keith Haring unrolling this, this is just sheets of vellum, and saying, oh, but I'm not sure about this, this work, and uh, you all acquiring it, and then it, and then it going on. This was it being installed in Paris a few months ago uh, at his retrospective there at the, at the Modern Art Museum. Um, so it, it's beautiful that you can see that trajectory there. But I want to I address when you say roll the truck up. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite <laughs> like that, okay? Uh, off, right. uh, some, it's really about... Well, as time went on, sometimes we feel like an urgency to keep a story together um, because we feel like there'll be a moment to share that story. So uh, like in the case of this young artist who made this huge amount of work in six weeks in our, in, at our collection, we asked him, I said, you, f you know, it's not like we have a contract between us. You can take all the work, you can sell all the work, we will make, if you, you give us a price, if we can afford it, we would love to keep this work together. And we feel like we have a, a treasure that is a story to tell. So it's not about, it's not so much like possessing, the, the, but I feel like, I don't know, I think that we have given ourselves over to caring. And this, when we take this, this is a, this is a, it's, it's a, we can, we can make this work, it enhances our life, but it also allows us to engage with the with public and with, with students and do the things that really um, is tremendously enriching for, for... It's also very important to other young artists because when young artists often see one piece of an artist and they don't see the evolution of an artist. And I think that evolution is so important for that young artist to develop and, and, and go forward themselves. Well, 20 years after we bought the work, 
we gave, uh, we had an ex one of our first exhibitions, 20 years ago when we opened our public space, uh, we gave, Keith Herring was one of the first exhibitions we gave. And it was already, you know, it was 20 years that we had acquired this work. And, um, well, we feel tremendously privileged that we can do that. Is it, these are some more examples of some of the pieces in the collection. Um, and then it, then it brings us to Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, it, it was, so this, this painting was acquired in 1981. And it was through, was it, it through Keith? Actually, it was, when, remember when we went to the subway uh, uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning? Uh, unfortunately, Basquiat was not there that day. But everyone was talking about this extremely talented artist who himself had a tag, you know, went by a, 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 his own tag. But he, he was already, he had, they, they talked about him as like he does work on canvas. It was kind of, yeah, he's talented, but you know, he's kind of a little bit of a traitor. You know? <laughs> because for them, it was like painting on the subway um, and the graffiti was really a kind of a movement. But anyway, he, we ended up meeting him in the basement of the, he had already had a gallery and he was working in her basement and we came to know him. And he was very special. He was really, really talented and was Keith Herring's best friend. And he never, Keith never stopped talking about how talented Jean-Michel Basquiat was. Actually, t I heard that you're gonna see that Jean-Michel Basquiat movie. That it's really interesting because the maker of that movie was Julian Schnabel. And John michel Basquiat hated Julian Schnabel. <laughs> and the reason he hated him is when, when, when Schnabel had his big show, Keith and, and Jean Michel went to see the show in the afternoon, and uh, Schnabel threw them out. He said, I don't want these kids around here. And, well, and it, he ends up making the The truth the of the matter concert. is that they were, I can't even begin to tell you how arrogant that generation of Julian Schnabel, David Sally, they were very arrogant. It was just, I don't know what it was. You know, each generation has its, like, persona. It was a very arrogant generation. And uh, Jean-Michel and Keith Heron became really good friends with, with Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol really took them under his wing. He just loved Basquiat and he loved Keith Haring because they were kind of the kids in the street. Keith, you know, was the kind of kid, he, he was smart and ambitious and generous, but like he couldn't stand being in school anymore and he left uh, school early. I mean, he was, they were kind of the kind of rat. Uh, Andy Warhol recognized and felt the talent. The intuition told him that these were really talented, out of the, uh, out of the box talented kids. And, but he also knew that Jean Michel had a terrible addiction. And uh, Andy Warhol at that time was really good friends with, uh, with Don's brother. And I can't tell you how hard Andy tried to turn Jean Michel uh, around. He would collaborate with him. He would do everything for him, but in a way he said, they, I may be trying to save their life, his life, but they saved my life. Because he said I became Art had become kind of, I don't know. He he he, he said he, he ran out of he ideas. Ran, he said he ran out of ideas. He kind of he, he felt his art was his ambition and his his he, it just got flat for him, and he felt like the combination of Jean Michel and Keith brought him back to loving art again and and being excited to which by the way happens a lot and you know having young people around you with fresh ideas and Taking their energy. A few years. Okay. So, um, okay. oh, sorry. Yeah, these, these are the Jean-Michel. Now, now we're at, at the show here, and um, I feel like for, well, there, there's one, one more thing. We mentioned you, you teaching in Harlem, and you, you also saw Martin Luther King speak in D.C. In, in 1963, and it's really, oh, then we come to Rashid Johnson. So this is a, a very large photograph. I was on the bus with Harry right. Belafonte. <laughs> this, by the way, is the I only X-rated you know lecture you know you're going to hear in this I never museum. I, I just kind of, it would just was there for me, but with the whole celebration just this last year, I said, oh my God, I mean, I just like, I was on the bus with Harry yeah, Belafonte. Yeah, what brought you there? I mean, what? Harry Belafonte, she had such a crush <laughs> on Harry Belafonte. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I was in love with Harry. I was in love with Harry Belafonte, but you know what? It was like, it was like being caught in a, it was like a, a the, it was a movement like a river, 
you know, it was like everybody that I knew that was smart and uh, the, every young person that I knew in school, I went to Brooklyn College, and everybody smart was going to Washington. And, and it was like, wow. Plus there were events that were starting to happen that was just so beyond. This is before, this was like around when I met you, but then you were called off, Don was off to the, anyway, he was, he, you know, in those days, military service was not voluntary, so he was like, they, they shipped him off. To, he, was, he was on the Bay of Pigs um, uh, invasion. But I was Cuba. on the American side. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, I, it was like, you had, I mean, I had to go. It was like, and then Harry Belafonte. And then when we got to Washington, and then when we got to Washington, it was unbelievable. It was like... That was amazing, and the inauguration that I went to was also amazing. You know, the, uh, I mean, it's funny that this show happened in December, and President Obama was in, the inauguration took place in January, and the show was in the planning for three years, and it was just, it was. You know, sometimes you can't explain what? it. You get, you're like inside a history. You don't even understand what it means even. And then all of a sudden you say, oh my God, it's 50 years that, that have passed and you were there. And that's how I feel, but it's incredible. And what now this show. What about the difficulties though around organizing this show and the challenges and, and the resistance you met? Well, every white person thought we were absolutely insane to do a show like this. I mean, we're white collectors, African-Americans, all of that. But so we decided, okay, this is why in the catalog, the first thing we say is we own this work. This is not some opportunity we're looking for. This is work that we've collected for 30 years. And we started having a conversation with, these, with the artists because we're friends with them, we knew them. And we said, what, what do you think about a show like that? And at first they said, you know, we're always in black shows. We'd like to be in some regular shows, you know? We need opportunity outside of ourselves. And that was a valid, you know, we don't need ghettoization. We need opportunity. So we said, I don't know. And we kept talking about it and saying, you know, somehow these are, we, had, we were always putting, we, we were always doing shows with Kara Walker in it or, or uh, David Hammonds was in, our, in, in, in general shows that we were doing. I said, but this, we feel a moment has come, not to, about ghettoization of these artists, but to celebrate something was happening that was so powerful. And that something was re revealed itself in all the studios we go to. You know, when you go to the studios, you hear the beat of the talent, you hear the beat of the, I don't know, there's just the beat when you're really talking to all these people in the studios. And there was were, they were so much talent coming out of this community. And when we talked to them about, and it turns out, like in, with Micheline Thomas, she said, oh, wait a minute. She said, uh, we say, what do you think about, who, who inspires you? She says, well, Robert Coldescott, David Hammonds, um, really Carrie James Marshall. I said, wow, those are artists in our collection already. How, wh what do you think if we like put together you and these artists, said, you must be kidding. This would be unbelievable. I mean, these are artists that are my idols. But I think we have to back off a little bit. We are not collectors of African-American art. This art was collected by accident because we only collect the best art that we see. And what happened after five or six or seven years, we realized that in a disproportionate number of the artists that we were collecting happened to be African-American. And this show rose, after, in a sense, after the event. This was not... Uh, it was not taken. Uh, it wasn't a theoretical show. We said, oh, we're going to do a show of African-American artists. It became clear that we had a collection that we in the, kind of collected by way of just collecting interesting artists, be they women or Germans or Russians or Americans or Californians or Polish, whatever. We collect them all over the world. So it just came to us that, wow, we can tell a very powerful story here. And so it But I it, think that's why the artists accepted it. They accepted yeah. it not because they weren't being given this as a gift. They accepted it because they knew they'd earned it. And it was just an opportunity to show three separate generations of, of black artists in, in, a, in a context of their own. And when they, when they thought about it, 
They said, this would be fantastic. There's really not been a show of contemporary black art in America. It is a frightening thought. But there had not been a show up to that point. Well, there, was this, there were some significant exhibitions. The Studio Museum. The Studio Museum. Uh, Thelma Gold, she, she was doing incredible breakthrough shows and a lot of the art that, of the young artists that we were collecting was a result of us being connected and going, we never missed the show at the Studio Museum because we knew that there was such incredible talent and, and they were doing all this legwork, bringing all these incredible artists. But this was always unigenerational. They might do a show of artists from the 60s, they might do a show of artists from the 2000s, but this was not approaching it horizontally, but rather vertically, where you saw the relationships between the work of uh, someone like Barclay Hendricks and, and someone like Rasheed Johnson. And the, the nude figure of Rasheed Johnson was really, that, you, that was shown was really an homage mm -hmm. They didn't, they didn't, they don't have yeah, that. Yeah, 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 it's I in the showed, catalog. Oh, you that saw that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this painting. Well, uh, the was thing an homage is, to Barclay Hendrick, and, and I think it's important to show there is a continuity in the history. So why is this such an important work of art? It's important because you know what? Let's, the, you know, portraiture, figure, figure, figuration, white male figuration uh, of men and women is part of daily life in the art world. I mean, this is what, this is what artists paint. But so why is it of a figure of a black man become so outrageous and so, um, it's so outrageous. But so going back to, so uh, there came a moment for three years, we were in these conversations. Do you mind? Okay. So after three years, we were in this conversation. Should we do the show? Should we not do? And constantly talking and talking to each other with the various artists. And there came a moment when actually, the naming of the show was critical. One day, and we, we struggle with titles, it's so hard to come up with the right title. So one day, our son said, I have an idea for a title. He said, I mean, among us, he said, there, the Museum of Modern Art used to have these shows years ago, the 50s and you know, the 40s and the 50s, of 15 Americans. It was a big deal. Or 18 Americans uh, or 12. 18, 12 Each Americans. year they did Each a show. year it was like the new stars, the new, the new crop of talent. Uh, they would present these um, American, Americans. He said, you know what? These are 30 Americans. When I, I'll never forget this, when I called up Hank Willis Thomas on the phone and I said, Hank, we have a title which we want to share with you and we're curious what you think. And I said, 30 Americans. There was complete silence. And I said, Hank, are you there? Are you there? What, what, what's, what's happening? He said, Mira, that's amazing. I mean, I feel like I was just given citizenship. Think about it. I mean, America. And these shows at the Museum of Modern Art, as far as I remember, there was only one black artist that ever appeared in these shows. Okay, and for what it's worth, there weren't too many women artists either, but there was only one black artist. So, that's... Um... Yeah, and, you know, talk, talking about Rashid Johnson, I just wanted to share with the audience, I mean, there's some really beautiful pieces as well, and, and we'd like to open it up for, uh, for questions, too, to the audience, and I encourage you. There, there's one, one last photo, this is quite nice. Uh, the president walked over with his wife uh, and family to visit the exhibition when it was at the Corcoran, and... Um, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is them there visiting, and it was not, um, the press was not invited, and this is a photo for uh, internal use only, but it was uh, a Does this mean really you get meaningful. arrested as soon as we leave here? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll probably get arrested. But um, I must say, she knows more about art than he does. Not, no, 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 actually, the curator said, I mean, because I guess growing up in Chicago, he was, he was friends with quite a bit of the oh, artists. Really yeah, yeah, yeah Carrie James. And actually, he just, it's funny, uh, so many of the artists in 30 Americans have actually already have been invited to the White House. And I understand that a Glenn Ligon is now hanging in the White House, and I know that Rashid Johnson has been to the White House. It's very special. I mean, I think, that, oh. Is that our cue? We're, we're, we're uh, they're gonna let the, uh, the hounds out. Oh my so. God. But, but yeah, please, please ask any and all questions. You know, we'd be really happy to, uh, to answer them. Sorry. You know, this, please. 
it, it yeah. never it never started as a traveling show. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we've been really fortunate. This is um, got this maybe the sixth venue. Uh, so it was presented in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Norfolk, Virginia, in Washington, D.C., uh, at Milwaukee Art Museum, and onwards from here, it's going to the New Orleans Contemporary Art Center. From there uh, to Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, San Antonio is, is going to present the exhibition, uh, possibly in, uh, in France, just north of Paris as well. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving out one or two, but yeah, we've been really fortunate. In Brazilian, I guess. And, and yeah, hopefully in 2016, Brazilia will present this. Oh, not Brazilia. But not, not Brazilia, Rio or something. I was born in Brazilia, so don't, don't slay <laughs> Brazilia, but, but Sao Paulo. I didn't know anyone I, I was just born want to say, I know this is, I, this, it, I have to say that um, to make the, to, to operate inside of this, this family construct where we're constantly needing each other's support, I can't tell you what it means to have um, an adopted, an adopted <laughs> <laughs> member That's of the true. family. Uh, Juan has been with us almost 15 years, and um, uh, it's like an extraordinary journey together. No, and uh, as I said, I, we, we keep waiting for the adult to show up. Well, so far, <laughs> so well, far. Actually, the amazing thing, I mean, Juan is okay. But the amazing thing is his son knows the name of every single dinosaur. He's four. <laughs> he's, four. I'm gonna... he's four years no, old. It, it means that it, it, sometimes we really, uh, uh, we get, it, it's a little, it's, it's, it's frightening how, how uncontrolled this whole situation is. I mean. Miro calls me <laughs> about once a year and, and look me in the eye and say, have we completely lost our minds this time? No, the, the losing our minds came with, you know, we're going ago. to be presenting, um, we're presenting um, chi 28 Chinese. By the way, it's interesting in the title because we struggled so much with the title. We were going to name it every which name in China, you know, made in China, China, this, China. At the end of the day, we realized, you know what? 30 Americans address the individuality, the power of the, indivi the individual. And when we ended up seeing, traveling to, uh, visiting 100 studios in China and selecting 28 artists that we ended up collecting, and that's the exhibition we're going to do, the only relevant name for this exhibition was 28 Chinese. We weren't going to comment on China at yeah. all because yeah. it's so vast. It would have been so pretentious to, to even address any but, part but of China. But next year we're calling it a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now, so I, so anyway, one of the artists, th now this was over the top, and we were hoping that Juan would stop us. Of course, he didn't, okay? So the piece has 9,000 parts, 9,000 parts. So originally, the artist said, oh, no problem. I'll send over like 12 people to help install it. Well, <laughs> but um, we actually, you actually found uh, FIU uh, or? Uh, yeah, we're, uh, yeah. It but was. they're still sending four from China, China to make sure we do it. It's right. nine thousand pieces that you saw. You saw the image. Uh, it's it's a. It's a tunnel like. It's a tunnel like. It's a it's a it's a boat. Yeah, yeah like a minimalist. Uh, we tunnel saw with this. Here. We saw this. We first saw this in a studio in oh, Beijing. That's the paper, that's the paper, paper piece, piece. Yeah, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? We first saw it in a studio in Beijing. If you ever plan on going to China, never go in the winter time to Beijing. I can't tell. It, first of all, they don't. Most the studios don't have heat, and um, the conditions were intense. And uh, but for the sake of full disclosure, I have to tell you, it hasn't been put together yet. So no. I'm not sure. It's arriving. It's going to be arriving in the next. When is it coming? It's here. It's it's here. here. There. Yeah. Yeah. The parts it's are here. They're gonna, you know, they're it's just come. interesting about a whole. You know, this, this show and the thirty Americans is. We can spend so much time talking about the other. Well, this show and the Chinese is also a conversation about the other, because this is like, who the hell are these Chinese anyway? You know, they, they steal our jobs, they take, you know, they do this, they do that, do this, this and this. And, you know, and they also, you know, whatever. The, the interest. No, no, I don't know. I'm saying you can make, you can make, I'm saying the, you can make so many negative generalizations about the other. For us, um, traveling across China, and meeting a hundred artists introduced us to the humanity that all of us share. And um, we cannot make any generalization, all the cliches, 
and all the generalizations that you can make about uh, the other, um, they fade away when you're in the presence of people that, are, that you're meeting and that you're eating with and that you're communicating with and who are you know, expressing their inner souls and in the art that they make. So um, I think that in the way that we got to know them, uh, they're all desperately trying to get over here to, um, to, to be part of the show. I mean, we keep apologizing. I wish we had the budget where we could afford to bring every one of them here. Um, during Documenta, I was away about 10 years ago, arranged to have 1,000 Chinese brought to, to Kassel, which she succeeded in doing. And that was like a shock, you know, 10 years ago to bring, like, he wanted to show people, like, just introduce 1,000 Chinese to a world that really didn't know them. But I wish we could do that. But I understand they're all trying to come here. And, and we're gonna, they, we're gonna, I think that we are going to, hopefully our show introduces, you know, a, an art, because there's so many cliches about, you know, what Chinese art is about. Because most people think, oh, what they do is just copy. You know, they just copy. You tell them what you want and they make it. I mean, it was so interesting. I had this conversation just the other day. He says, oh, you're doing a Chinese show. What did you tell them what you want? I mean, what did you put in an order? Because we're thinking of made in China. You just send it over there and they make it. Well, you know what? That's a cliche about an other. And what we came to realize is Human beings are not others. They're like, when you get to know them, we're all, we're all striving. You know, I mean, I don't know. This is, they're, actually, they're very, they're very, pardon? Sorry, did someone say something? Actually, when Juan uh, asked for a question, it made me think when we were in China, we, we were in Chengdu, and they invited us to speak at the university very spontaneously. And they said, well, we said, when do you want us to speak? And they said, in two hours. We said, fine, we think we'll have 10 people in the auditorium. 300 people show up. No, and it was a thousand people auditorium. It was packed, maybe okay, two thousand. thousand. It was Whatever like a, it, was. it was a sea of people, a, a sea of students showed up within two hours but of what, announcing. But whatever it was, so we spoke, and and when we finished, they asked for questions, and not a single hand was raised for questions. This was very peculiar. And Mira had the idea. Either Mira, or my daughter, I don't remember which, had the idea that. You don't have to ask the question, just write them on a piece of paper. And we and, take for granted. They're, they're so not used to speaking publicly, especially in controversial, that, that they wouldn't do it. And all of a sudden there was a. a Every blitz single of person paper handed came in, in a piece of paper and, with a question. And six hours later, we were still trying to deal with the questions. Because each there was a question, there was interpretation, and interpreter. But it's interesting, we take for granted that. Uh, but here you're allowed to I ask mean, questions. No, no, so but just yeah, yeah, please ask in a way or We not, take right. for granted that you can stand up and ask a question, and you, you're not going to be, you know, that, that there isn't some, you know, somebody like you know, ready to arrest you because of your political views. And uh, it, was, it was very, very powerful when we had you, it, hu hundreds of these papers came back to us with these questions. And we stayed the entire, it was like into the night answering all these questions. It was incredible. But, but it's not an empty uh, thread. I mean, uh, what well, piece that if you come to see So do you have any questions? <laughs> a piece if you come to see the show you won't yes, see yeah. is uh, there was a piece of this soldier and the artist, it was a 10-foot bronze, and he cracked the, the figure open. And it was a very poetic piece, and no political content that we were able to see. And when it reached customs leaving China, they, they refused to ship they it. Refused to ship it. They, they, I, I don't know what the word is, but they arrested the piece. And, and we've never they confiscated the piece. We've never seen it since. So maybe they were smart not to. But you're allowed to ask questions, please. I'm not 100% sure how to answer it, but I'll answer it differently. That when well, they did a survey of collectors, and the largest single group of collectors of art were doctors. And so it's, a, it's uh, I don't know, maybe because medicine has uh, 
pressure rigid forms that the opportunity to, to use the other side of your brain is, is so tempting that they can't resist. We, we can't resist. But there are, even now, there are an inordinate number of people who, who are in areas that, that are, I don't want to use the word rigid, but are very orderly where you, where you try not to make a mistake at all costs. It's but in nice collecting, to go to areas where, you, where your, your brain kind of but floats. The, but the collecting, mind you, now happens in this very, very, uh, it's, it's a total collaborative. And the interesting thing is even though we've been married now, this is our 50th year, and our son participates in it, you can't imagine how much argument, how much fighting, how much convincing, how much uh, lobbying sometimes there is for a piece. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, look, it's an interesting mix because, you know, I'm left brain, Mira is totally right brain, and our son is the only one with kind of a whole brain, and he always ends up with the deciding vote in these things. It's very frustrating. Uh, but, but because we approach it from some such different perspectives, it really helps in making a kind of final decision. But it's interesting the role that you're right. Juan you can has. Imagine. Now, the, the role that, that Juan has. It's, it's, a, it's embracing the peace and embracing the, this, and sometimes it's, um, some of these things take time to, to, to um, they reveal themselves over time. Mm. Uh, but you're always so trusting, and I really, really appreciate that. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> lucky, I'm really lucky. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. One, one last one. It's a defect in our system. We still use the same 25%. And the other thing, and Mira always speaks about this, art is available at all price points. And, and you know, it, uh, I mean, not to boast and, and saying things I shouldn't even say, but I'm going to say them anyway, of course. The Basquiat was a total of $2,500. 800 $2,800. No, no, it was, it was only $800. $800. <laughs> and the yeah, worst thing about it is we bought two, and one of them was sold out from under us because we took too long to pay for that. Cindy which, Sherman. Which rarely happens. I have to say, you make a deal with a the gallerist. They always and they come to right. trust you. They're never going to do that. It was just one scum. Well, it was one. <laughs> no, but. Now, Cindy Sherman <laughs> was $25. The first no, Sydney no, Sherman we but, bought. But the thing is that it's not like it was cheap. We've never bought anything cheap. We've always bought up to the limit of what we can afford. So right now we say, oh, $25, oh, $800. I mean, every time we buy a work of art, it's really, even today, we really, we really go to the limit. And um, we do everything in our power not to sell the art. We do not sell art, but occasionally, 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 we will have a piece that is not as relevant as another piece inside of the story that, that is being, that is unfolding. And we have an opportunity to, to sell a piece which then, for example, we sold a piece that really helped us fund the entire Chinese exhibition that we put together. And it was a piece and, we'd never shown. And we, a piece that never, never shown, and it was the least important piece of a whole body of work that we had. In, and it didn't affect the artist in any way, and it was an opportunity that we had to take. And occasionally we do do that. But um, our objective is never, never to sell because look at the power. You that, lose you the have, continuity of the story. Look at the story. power in being able to tell a story. It's like, how, why would you sell that story? And now that we, we, uh, we take uh, the, 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 the voice that one can get inside of this public mission. The, the, when we see the kind of educational you know, impact these works of art have inside of our own space and when it goes into the world. I mean, we travel exhibitions. There are hundreds of works that are traveling around the globe now. You would th I mean, you know what? 50 years is a long time. It, it's like, it seems like yesterday. But if you're devoted, when you wake up like we wake up, every morning we have two hours between 
we wake up sometimes, like this morning, we're up at five o'clock for two hours, and that's all we do is talk about art. And if you can, it's a, it, it's, it's, and, and you commit yourself, like we also, we're very, in our work, we, you know, we're in the hotel business, and, our, and we're together with our son, our daughter's an artist, um, doing wild stuff. <laughs> Uh, but our son is in business with us. He's an art history major. Our daughter is a art, art history major. The kids are, they've taken this very seriously. Grandkids. But the amazing thing oh, is, our, our is our daughter-in-law, because she allows her husband and us to do this insanity. And we, we devote every penny we have to, to to buying art. But this you is know, our... this is a thing that is always asked of us because Art Basel comes to Miami and there are all these art fairs and people say, oh, it's easy for you to say, look at the artwork you've collected, blah, blah, blah. But what Don said is absolutely every single person, every single person in this room can dedicate themselves to buying an original work of art by an artist right here. And that and artist take you a long would time be to pay extremely it happy if you made any arrangement, responsible arrangement, for the payment of that work. So if it's $2,000 or $1,000 or $100, think of the, the, the incredible creative support that you would give to, to listen, it happens, I, we took a walk on, on, what is it, the main street here? It's amazing. Broadway. They're like, what, a, hundreds of bars, right? Those bars can't afford to pay their talent, but they play. And the public supports that talent by, you know, coming into the space. And I guess they, they, they tip all these performers. It's incredible. It's incredible what what We what weren't sure. Here. Do the performers get paid? Or, I don't or most think they them, do. I, they huh? don't. They're tips. All tips. And you know what? So here, you, what I'm saying is you, every single person, that, that is a support of performance, right? But you can support art that's being made in this town by committing $100 a week to it, or $50 a week to it. You can do exactly what we've done. Please. Oh, sorry, last and do, question. And then do. We, we gotta... I was just going to say, I'm, I'm actually a bassist down at that play. I have a gig tonight after this. Oh, where? We'll come yeah, and we're... I want to go. go. Where are you gigging? Where? Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's some pay for the bar, it's usually like 40 bucks per guy for a four-hour gig, and then it's just on top of this. Where are you playing tonight? Can we ask? Oh, Okay. All right, we'll be there. What time? <laughs> we'll be there. No, but you know what I, you know what I'm trying to say. If there, there is. But it, I mean, we, we depend on the people coming in and supporting. You know, you make requests. Well, exactly, and you know what? The young artists in this city, I'm sure there are many of them. Uh, I mean, you're talking about performance art, but there are there are plenty of art. How many artists are here in the audience? Hmm? Oh wow. my God! Tell me that you wouldn't love to have all these people as your collectors, right? No, I Tell me you wouldn't be happy to work out a payment schedule. Tell me that you wouldn't love for them to come and visit you on a regular basis. We used to have a little index card where we'd mark off like what the payment. Uh, uh, that our son at the age of 12 started his own collection uh, doing that. So yeah, it, and you know what? It's funny how 50 years later you look back and you have a Keith Haring. He wasn't Keith Haring. Jeff Koons wasn't a Jeff Koons. Well, actually, I could go closer to that. Probably the, the most sought-after artists and the two most sought-after artists in the, in the contemporary world right now are two people called Wade Guyton and Kelly Walker. They both went to school and lived in Memphis right down the road. Uh, well, when we first bought their work, they were it was, I, I think we could have walked out of the studio with it. They just wanted to get rid of it practically. So that, you know, everybody starts somewhere. And, and you know, you can't, it, yeah, sure, if you, if you go out and buy a Warhol now and you pay a zillion dollars for it, you're not going to be able to do it. No, the, the most incredible, yeah. you could have done it. Yeah, when you look every at Every artist was young once. It, it's, out of, it's an out-of-body experience seeing when I look at this work, it's, 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 it's an out-of-body experience that all these artists have become so known and so famous and so, I mean, but, I forget, I forget you, you yeah, just, yeah. just go with Not your, in, so. just go with Thank your you intuition and buy work uh, and uh, support 
the, the talent that's here, and you can it's, do it. It's a, hell of a, it's a hell of a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all. You thank, you so thank you much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you very much. What a, I, t I promised you a wonderful evening. Please enjoy the exhibition. We're open until 9 o'clock, and I'm sure the Rubels will be here for uh, individual questions. Thank you so much.